everyone's in here, so I will start. My name is Nick Cano. This talk is called Plus One Million Minus Zero, kind of a shout, hub to, or a shout out to Git, because I'm going to talk about how me and a couple of my colleagues generated over a million lines of code for a clone of an online game. And the video just went out. My computer is not liking it. Please come back. Oh, Skype's going crazy. Let me. <laughs> Go away. OK, let's, let's hope it works. Um, so the project was actually done by these guys down here, mostly. I'm kind of a technical expert when it comes to this game because I've been hacking it for a long time. So I helped them a lot when they needed help reverse engineering packets or data structures and stuff. But really, everyone but me did the hard work, and I'm just here to talk about it. So who are we? We are a mixed bag of, like a mixed international bag of game hackers, developers, and so on. Uh, and what are we doing? Well, we're using bots and game hacks. And we are, we are basically cloning an online game. So by capturing packets, capturing the data that comes from a game, to the game client, we're going to clone all of that data so we can run our own custom server. And why? Because, well, we want to, for the most part. So I'm 23 years old. I am the author of Game Hacking, Developing Autonomous Bots for Online Games. I'm the CEO and lead engineer at Xenobot. That's a bot for the game we'll be talking about. Um, I've, I work at Bromium as a senior security engineer. We're an endpoint security company. And this is my third time speaking at DerbyCon, which I think is the best hacker conference there is. So your takeaways are going to be like a cool, like cool ways to apply your hacking techniques to non-hacking tasks. I mean, it's still hacking, but it's it's non-conventional when you're hacking games. A lot of people look at hacking as like cyber criminal versus like security specialist. And I think the video just went away again. Sorry, my laptop really doesn't like anything. See, this didn't happen when I was giving the talk at work for practice, but it always happens to me at DerbyCon, so. Maybe it's loose. Can't give me a break, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, now we're here. Now we're here again. Now let's hope it stays like this. OK, I'm just going to step away from the computer. I feel like bumping it is moving stuff. Can you guys all hear me well without the mic? OK, hopefully it picks something up. So. And it's, we're just going to get an example of how you can apply your technical skills to whimsical projects. And you're not going to learn to juggle. What I mean by that is this is a very specific thing we did for a very specific game. So you're going to get some cool ideas, and you're going to learn about game hacking, but you're not really going to be able to reproduce this one-to-one -one because you've probably never even heard of the game we're going to talk about. But there will be some open source stuff at the end so you can learn how the internals of everything works. So background information. So the game we're going to be talking about is a game called Tibia. It's a 2D MMO. It's been around for over 15 years now. Um, there's millions of players from all over the world, but mostly Brazilians, uh, people from Poland, people from Sweden. It's created by a German company, and it's ruled by bots right now. So about 95% of the people who are playing are actually bots at this point, and probably about 40% of them are using my bot. So if we look at the architecture of Tibia, we have the Tivia client on the player's computer. It connects to a login server, this red line right here. That's actually secured with RSA. So the client has an embedded public key by which it will encrypt the, like, the account name, the password, and a few other things, as well as a 16-byte XT key, which will be used later. It'll send it to the login server. Login server will spit... Okay. The login server will spit back a list of characters and IP addresses that can be connected to. So it'll basically say character number one, connect to this IP address on this port, character number two, and then the user just sees a list of characters, clicks on them, and then the client knows what to connect to. That will be important in a minute if we get the slides back. This is getting really annoying. I know, I hate me right now too. Yeah. 
Yes. We have an, I have an HDMI to VGA adapter right now. No. Because does, does this have HDMI on it? Okay, this guy is going to be a savior. We're going to switch over really quick, and then I'm going to talk very fast to try to catch up to where I should be. My first DerbyCon, I spent 20 minutes just trying to get the video working, so this is already going better. And that was a different laptop, so I think it's me that has a problem. For moments. It sees this, but this doesn't seem to see it. Yeah, can you get one on there for me and maybe then this will work? Okay, let me switch back to this adapter with the laptop over here and see what happens. So, stick straight, don't move. I think it's coming. Uh, it should be this VGA. Okay, it sees it. It says installing device driver software. Come on, we're almost there. Wait. <laughs> it's definitely a short. Because as I move it, it gets mad. Okay. No more problems, please. I'm not even doing a demo, and the demo gods are already shitting on me. So. Let's, let's recap here. We talk to the login server over RSA, get a list of characters and IP addresses. We get that. We select a character. It connects to one of the mini game servers, which is the IP given by the login server. Cool. Now let's look at OpenTibia. OpenTibia is an ecosystem of open source software to run custom Tibia servers. Some guys back in 2001 reverse engineered the protocol, made an open source project. Since then, it's been growing. It's been very stable. And the amount of players on OpenTibia actually rivals the amount on the real game just because there's like hundreds of servers out there. So how that works, we have this guy right here called an IP changer. So inside the Tibia client, there is a list of login server domain names, and there's a public RSA key. What the IP changer does is it changes the RSA key to a different public key that the OT server has a private key for, just using write process memory. It's pretty simple. It's in there as a long string. And then it changes those domain names, also using write process memory, to the domain names that point to the OT login server. And then the OT login server can spit back its own IP addresses and character list, and then the client will connect to the game server that way. So really our end goal here is we wanted to create our own OpenTibia server, but we didn't want to like do all the hard parts of making the content. We just wanted to rip it off. Some people would call that stealing. I'd call it just very meticulously documenting the game in formats that can be used to show the game. We were almost there. If I don't touch it, will it work? I'm just going to switch laptops really quick. It really hates me. And we're going to roll with a slight
slightly old version of the presentation, it seems. If this laptop is even charged. Okay, now it wants to see the thing again. We're back. I'll let this one boot and we'll talk. Doesn't this suck? Tried to full screen it. Yeah, so I'm just going to boot up this other laptop and then we're going to go from here. I'm so sorry. Oh, Windows update. <laughs> okay, let's let's roll without slides. I've done this before. I think I can. I think I can make it happen. I am so sorry. So, oh my God, there's so many like gifs and diagrams that I made. And they took me so long, and we're just getting to them. Well, we have two different adapters depending on what kind of laptop we I'm got. I'm HDMI going to VGA. Um, I think my laptop is and just. And did you plug in the power for it? No, you want me to try? Yes, that? let's try the power. Some of them don't. Oh, is that your your one? No, this one here. Yeah, we have, we have one here also that belongs to us. Yeah. Plug in the power for the adapter just to see. Oh, for the the adapter has yeah. power? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Just make sure that one gets back to that adapter and vice versa, you know. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, it looks like you have the same cable matter as one we do, so just make sure that Michael gets back to Chris at the end of the talk. That one wouldn't have to have any display for it, would it? No. Has uh, mini VGA, which no one has. So, if yeah, the. VGA. <laughs> this guy right here. That's mini display. No. Sure. I tried it. It looks very similar, but it's not. Okay, so let's see if putting power on this thing made it work. Okay, so that is a projector. Extend. Apply. Oh, yeah. Keep changes. Let's hope this power works. This is really my life right now, and I want it to get better. Well, it's okay. Going there. Is it going there? Yeah. Let's let's see. So, let's talk about how we generated the map. So it's a two-dimensional tile-based map. So you can think of it as like a two-dimensional array, more or less. It's actually three-dimensional, we'll get into that soon. It's extremely large, so there's roughly 13 million tiles on the map. That's not including blank tiles and stuff. It's like four billion square tiles. It's literally like 6555, 65,000 by 65,000 nearly. So it's really big, but there's a lot of empty tiles, and it's completely server-side, so that's the inherent problem here. The server stores the map, and it gives it to the client on a need-to-know basis. And there's no way to spoof your location in the game. You can't say, I'm at this place in the game, now I'm here, now I'm here. So you can't teleport around infinitely fast and get the server to tell you everything. It controls everything there is. So we need to walk everywhere in the game if we want to intercept the entire map. So how do we do that? So first let's look at the map structure. So it's this 15 by 13 grid. You can kind of see how it's laid out here. And it looks like this. So these white tiles are what you saw on screen. These gray tiles are a two tile buffer off screen. So when you move around, you don't see like a black space or anything. It'll just load the next row. So if I take a step to the right, it will load in a new row here. This row will get added to the on screen stuff. The green row will get added to the off screen on the left and it just drops this entire row. Same happens if I'm moving down. If I'm moving diagonal, it's a combination of both. But basically as you move around in this game, the server just sends you exactly what you need to know appended on to what you already had, which was a full screen, which you get at login. So it's not actually two-dimensional, though, because we have 16 floors. Top floor is 0, bottom is 15, ground floor is 7. And you can kind of see how even as I'm going up floors, you can see the lower floors. So those must also be kept in memory, right? There's some rules for how they're kept in memory, but due to the display issues, we don't have time for those. So. 
we come to a few conclusions. We can either dump this map from memory, and we know the structure of it in memory, but it's too volatile. It's always changing as you move around. You'd have to be in sync with the game's main thread to dump this, because it's a very complex structure. It could be changing half of it where you've already read it, and then you're out of sync, right? Uh, can we hook the drawing layer and just intercept what's being drawn to the screen? Yes, that's actually very common. When you're working with games, you hook the stuff that draws the sprites, and you look at the sprite IDs, you tie those to the item IDs, and then you can determine what's being drawn and where, but it's very slow doing it that way. But can we intercept the packets and dump the map information? Yes, and it's very efficient. That's the way the client gets the data. It's the most, most readable serialized form. I mean, it's not actually serialized. They're not text packets. There's a protocol, but we can do it because we know that structure. So how can we intercept the packets? A guy called Sharp Map Tracker. This was actually written long ago by a guy called Ian Obermiller. He's at Facebook now. He used to be at Microsoft. It's an open source project that does just this. It intercepts map packets, but it's old. This is like from 2009. It was out of date. A lot of stuff has changed. So we're going to use that. And where will we get all of our data? Tibia cast recordings. We're going to talk about that in a second. And will it work? Yes, it did. So let's look at the architecture of the two things we just talked about. Sharp Map Tracker is an open source network proxy that generates OTBM map files. Those are the type of map files used by the server from captured map packets. And we have a fork with additional functionality, which we're going to talk about. And we've also updated it to work with the latest version of the game, which was important because it was old. So how that works is it intercepts this connection right here. It intercepts the login server connection. So it overwrites the RSA key in the Tibia client. We'll show source code for this so you can see how it all works too. But it intercepts this RSA connection by overriding the domain names and the RSA key. It overrides domain names to localhost. It connects to the map tracker with a custom RSA key. That then gets the data, uh, re-encrypts it with the right RSA key, and then sends it along. Just when, it come, when the login server spits back the domain name or the IPs for the game servers, it also overwrites those with localhost and acts as a man in the middle on the game server connection. That way it can intercept the game server packets. And then there's Tibia Cast. So this is a third party cast and replay system for Tibia. Uh, it works by if one of you guys is playing the game, the entire state of the game that you know about is there because the server sent it to you, right? It's entirely server based. So you do something, your action goes to the server, the server determines what the world looks like now and sends you an update. So the entire picture of the game as rendered by the client can be deduced from the packets. So this is basically like Twitch, but for this game in that instead of recording video, it records the packets and then it replays them to the viewer and their game client automatically generates the game state and draws everything. So it works similar to Sharp Map Tracker. It intercepts all this stuff up here, but instead of processing the game packets, it spits it out to its own set of servers. So this is a broadcaster. And then the viewer, it acts as like, it doesn't even act as a man in the middle here. It just acts as a login server. So you log in with no account number, no password. And the list of characters is the list of broadcasts you can watch. You connect to a broadcast and then it connects you to these servers, which replays the packets to you. And you have the whole view of the game. So this is like the main part of our project. And you're going to see why. So what is our plan? How are we going to take this map and duplicate it? We're going to scrape TibiaCast's archive, and we're going to grab millions of recorded sessions. So this is hundreds of thousands of people playing the game over millions of sessions. We have all of those packets ready to be replayed. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to play the game. All the data is right there. Then we're going to rewire Sharp Map Tracker to pretend it's the game client. Without a game client, we're just going to connect the Map Tracker to TibiaCast and replay the packets to it. No Tibia client, no drawing, no overhead, so we can do this very fast. And we're going to instrument this on a massive farm, and then we're just going to stitch everything together. So of all these casts, we'll be able to stitch together all the map data sent to us by the recorded sessions, and then when, there's some places where we might have multiple places said there's different stuff for the same location. We'll just use majority rules there. Whatever we saw most or whatever we saw first is what we use, and we stitch it all together, we have a map, profit. So did it work? It did. Uh, we had 130 megabytes of binary generated. That's 12 million tiles. 
and 16 million items. So a tile is defined as literally the ground tile. So if there's grass, it'll be like a grass tile, but there can be loose items on top of that, like chests and ladders and decorations and stuff. So there were 12 million tiles with 16 million total items on the map, and we got one-to-one -one replication. We skipped over a few cities because we weren't ready to code the quests for them yet, but for the cities we wanted and the quests we wanted, we had the exact game map without having to like play the game, without having to sit there and map it out manually. It was pretty cool. So that was kind of the easy part, though, because the map format's very well documented, and then we have stuff like spawns. So... Spawns can be thought of as the X, Y, and Z locations of a creature. So a game would be pretty boring if you had no creatures. You walk around this empty map and you do nothing. It's not fun. So we need to put monsters there. We need to put NPCs there. Um, and when you, when you do this on the OT server, it's represented as an XML file with the name of the creature and its location. So that's what we want to generate. But it's very tricky to perfect, and we'll see why. So let's first look at NPCs. NPCs are pretty basic. They can't despawn, and they're typically always in the same location. They might be behind a counter, or they might be in a shop. What happened? We were doing so well. Oh! It just wanted to troll me, I guess. Okay. I missed it again. Oh, it switched screens. Okay. So, they're typically in a set location, so determining where we want to put an NPC isn't really a problem. There's very few duplicates, too. NPCs stay in the same place. It's not a complex game where, like, there might be weather in the game that makes them run away, or there might be situations where they go away. It's pretty simple in that where you see an NPC, it might move around a little bit, but it's probably going to be there. <laughs> okay. So really all we need to know is how far that NPC can wander and where it must spawn. Monsters are a bit different. They can die because you can kill a monster, right? The point of a lot of video games is to go around and hunt monsters. You can kill them, they can die, they go away. That messes stuff up. Because if we're looking at a tibia cast and the guy is walking through a place where all of the monsters have already died, then we're going to say there's no monsters there. We need some way of figuring that out. They can also spawn in mobs. So you don't just see one demon. Oh. You don't just see like one demon or one troll, you see like five trolls or like three demons together. And what might happen, there might be a player who kills half of those, and then the person on the cast walks by, he only sees two trolls instead of five trolls. So how do we figure all that stuff out? Um, now this is just weird. It's doing screen cutting. I'm going to leave the mouse there. I'm tired of moving it. So what does this mean? Accurate spawn locations are important. Accurate mob counts are important. And these things are hard, much like AV. So we're going, so our plan, we're going to run this at the same time as the map tracking um, on the same farm using the same infrastructure of multiple tibia casts, spit at sharp map tracker. We're going to improve sharp map tracker to track the name the unique identifier and the initial location of every monster. So if you have a group of demons, five demons, each one will have a unique identifier. You kill them all, five more spawn. Those have a different set of unique idea identifiers from the last five, but they're each unique to the monster. So we track the initial location for each monster, meaning for each unique identifier. And I don't know what the hell is. Now my screen is just messed up. I can't see anything. Okay. We were doing so good. Okay. So, plan for NPCs. We're just going to determine the NPC location after farm run using majority rules. And we're just going to allow an NPC to wander in a bounding rectangle of all the positions it was seen on. So if NPC, if you imagine NPC was seen like here, and here, and here, and here, and it was seen most of the time right here, this is where we'll put it, and we'll allow it to walk around in a square that encapsulates all the locations we saw it on. That works pretty well. Monsters are a bit harder. So the monsters, we're going to cluster monsters with the same name in close proximity, so about five tiles away. So if we see five demons, 
The first one we see, we're going to say this is a new cluster of demons. And then if we see another demon within five squares of that, we're going to add it to that cluster and then add it to that cluster and then add it to that cluster. And we're going to do this multiple times on the same recording. If a player passes the same location multiple times in a time span, we'll do it on different recordings. We'll take all this data and then we'll match up all the different clusters. So we will match them based on monster name and centroid location. So we calculate a centroid of all the monsters in an area. So if there's a bunch of demons, we basically calculate the central point where they're standing. And then we say, if we have two groups of demons and their centroids are within like 10 squares or of each other or something like that, we're going to say those are the same cluster that we saw at different points of time. And then we'll take the average size of a cluster plus the standard deviation divided by two. So if sometimes we saw four demons and sometimes we saw six demons, the average amount of demons we saw was five. The standard deviation is like one-ish. We divide it, we round, we end up with five demons there, roughly. I think it just likes to switch which screen is doing what at random. I think it's time for a new laptop. Oh, Google Chrome crashed, then uncrashed. So, we got that. How much time do I have? Oh, I have enough time. We'll be good. So, we did all of this, and we ended up with 58,000, almost 58,000 creatures on the map. That was 125,000 lines of code we ended up generating, but it wasn't perfect. NPC spawns were great, but some changes had to be made. Sometimes there might be an NPC with the same name in two different locations. We didn't account for that because we knew it would be easier to do by hand. So you might take a boat to an island, and the NPC on the boat on the mainland might be the same NPC on the boat on that island because he's the one who took you there. So we had to account for cases like that manually. And then monsters. We had a bunch of weird cases with monsters. Sometimes the spawns were far too large because we took a bunch of different clusters and matched them together when they shouldn't have been. Sometimes spawns were far too small because they were being heavily farmed. So there's places in the game that are just always being farmed, always being botted. So if that's the case, no matter what data we have, there's going to be no monsters there because everyone's killing them. So those were far too small. We had to adjust that by hand. So we basically adjusted a lot of monster spawns by hand, but the base was there. and We just had to adjust, adjust counts and stuff like that. So NPC data. Now, we, we know where NPCs are, but... There needs to be code for NPCs. We can see, say the NPC Nick is standing here on the map, but how do we know what he does? So, it'll come back. So NPCs do a few things. They wear different outfits. They can move at different speeds, so some might walk really quickly, or some walk really slowly in the game. That matters in some quests, and it's kind of just a nice aesthetic to have, so we wanted to track that stuff. They have trade dialogues displaying the items that can be bought and sold. So I go to an NPC and I type hi and then I type trade. A dialogue pops up showing a list of all the items that NPC is willing to sell, for, sell to me and buy from me and at what cost. So we want that data because shop NPCs must exist in our version of the game. And they can have conversations. We can see these conversations essentially as question and answer. The player says one thing, the NPC says something back or says nothing. The player says another thing, the NPC either, either responds or doesn't. So we can record these conversations as like a question and answer dialogue and automatically plug these into the NPC scripts. The assumption is a lot, everyone playing the game will talk to every NPC at least once, so most of the stuff we can get that way. It's about to come back. Or not. Okay. So, we're going to run this at the same time as other things on our tracking farm. We're also going to improve our tracker again to track outfit speeds, trade dialogues, and conversations for each NPC. We're going to dedupe that data since there's no variations. So if there's one NPC that every single person talked to in every single cast recording that we had, we really don't care because it's all the same, so we just dedupe. We take the first instance of each line from each NPC, and then from the dedupe data, we're automatically going to generate Lua scripts, which is the language used here for each NPC. So the outfit and speed is pretty simple. Those are just a combination of numbers. The question and answers are put into a Lua table. And yeah, and the buy sell list is also a Lua table. The buy sell list we also catch with the map tracker. So 
873 NPCs, we automatically generated all the conversations, we automatically generated all their outfits, everything that we needed to make the game seem like a game. However, a lot of conversations that you have with NPCs in video games are related to quests. Some things you just can't say to an NPC unless you've unlocked a certain quest. Some things they won't say to you unless you've unlocked a certain quest. And sometimes saying something to an NPC unlocks a quest. That was... I, I don't know any algorithms that can do that automatically, so we did that by hand afterwards. We basically made our code generator leave blank spaces there. We just plugged in a few numbers when coding the quests by hand. Um, yeah, some NPCs exist in multiple locations and behave differently in each. So going back to the previous example, that boat NPC on the mainland might say a certain set of things and on the island might say a different set of things. We fix that manually because coming up with an algorithm would take twice as long as actually just fixing it. And then we also just, that outfit and speed data that we got for the NPCs, we also just grabbed it for monsters because why not? Monsters also have that data. We plug that into our monsters. Uh, some of them can cast haste spells, so a haste spell speeds them up. So we just took the highest speed we saw for each unique monster. Now we're talking unique monster by name. So we took, let's say, all the speeds that we saw a demon have. We threw away the maximum one, averaged them together, used that as its base speed, and then we added a haste spell to the code saying it can cast a haste spell, and the, mo the highest speed we ever saw is the speed we gave it for the haste spells. So we automatically generated some part of monsters there. And then some non-negligible uh, non -negligible amount of data was gathered by scraping a wiki website that's kept really up to date uh, with some NPC stuff and some monster stuff. I would go into detail on that, but the talk is too long. I didn't have time. But you can just think we wget a bunch of pages, and then we throw regex at, them, regex at them. Then we grab the results of the regex, we plug it into our scripts, and we're done. There was a lot of data there, but... Yeah. So now item data. So items are a combination of multiple things, and items are one of the most important things in a game, because if you have a sword and it doesn't do anything, it's a shitty sword. You can't use it, so we need to know all of the data about items, not just swords. We're talking like chests, we're talking decorations you can put in your house, we're talking potions. All of these things have attributes such as the item identifier name, the sprites that will be used to draw that item, a type, so is it a piece of ground, is it a weapon, is it a border on the ground, so basically something that meshes two grounds together seamlessly and looks nice, is it an armor, is it a helmet, what is it. Then there might be a text description. Uh, how much does it weigh? So if you can pick up an item, it weighs something because you can't just carry infinite amounts of stuff. Um, and then how much it costs to sell it or buy it from an NPC. And then it can have many different stats. So it can have zero or many of attack, defense, attack modifier, defense modifier, speed, skill level, magic level increase, level increase, level requirement, and a bunch of other stuff. So the name sprites and animations are handled by the client. We give the client a number, and it knows it's supposed to draw this thing. It's supposed to have this name, and it can animate it that way. And the NPC stuff... The purchase and resale value we had from tracking the trade dialogues on NPC, so we just kind of cloned that data over. And the rest of the information is server-sided. So how do we get this information? It's all on the server side on a need-to-know basis. So how do you get this from the server? You shift and click on an item, it gives you text that looks like this. So you can see 1850. You see a fire sword, attack 24, physical plus 11 fire. Defense 20 plus 1, it can only be wielded by players of level 50 or higher. 23 ounces, the blade is a magic flame. There's a large variation of different strings for different types of items and different types of stats. Uh, we wrote a lot of regex for this. So if you don't know what regex is, it's a pattern matching language. You write a pattern that matches some string. You say the string first starts with any characters that aren't... Uh, uh, opening parenthesis, and then you'll see ATK, and then you'll see a colon, and then you put parentheses to say, I want to capture this value, and slash D plus means any amount of digits, and that will capture the attack on that string, right? So we wrote a bunch of different regexes to capture all the stuff from all the different variations of strings like this. And then on our cast farm, we just intercepted all the look messages and ran the regex. But this wasn't sufficient, because people who are playing the game and broadcasting it they aren't running around like, let me look at all of my items. They know what their items do. People want to watch them play the game. 
So we had very, I don't know the number, but it was like less than 5% of the items that we needed had been looked at on our cast farm. So what are we gonna do about this? How can we track the remaining items? Incoming Xenobot. So, come on, it'll come back. So we're gonna use Xenobot. Xenobot is the bot I wrote for the game. And let me just get it on the slide that we need so when it comes back, we will have it. again. Okay, we're back. <clears throat> so, Xenobot is the longest running active bot for Tibia and Open Tibia. It was made by me. Uh, it automates gameplay, reads memory, captures packets, and it's Lua scriptable. The Lua scriptability is really what we used here. So, if you imagine the Tibia clients, this guy right here, it takes data from login server, takes data from game server, takes mouse and keyboard input, it does some stuff with it, and then it spits it out to your computer monitor. Uh, very bad diagram, but this is what it looks like when Xenobot's injected. So I intercept all network data, all mouse and keyboard input. I have all my own logic down here. I intercept stuff from the game state by reading memory. When the game tries to draw stuff with the graphics engine, I hook a bunch of functions so I can see everything that's being drawn. And then before, and after it's drawn, I can draw my own stuff on top. So it gives us god mode in the game. Really what we're going to use here is our drawing layer. So drawing stuff um, and then the game state memory reading for me reading map data in the live memory and then the Lua engine. So this is our backup plan. So we already had our plan. It failed. There wasn't enough stuff being looked at on TibiaCast. So we needed a backup plan. That was to write an Xenobot script to highlight any items that weren't in our data set. So this script would basically open our file that defines all of the items that our server had. It would read them and it would say, okay, what information are we lacking? And then if we see an item pop up in the game that we don't have in our data set, it's just gonna highlight it. It's gonna put a little square around it and we'll see that we don't have that item. And then we can look at it. We just look at it manually. Why does an Xenobot do it automatically? Well, we were doing this on high level characters and doing it automatically can get us banned because there's a lot of stuff on the map that the player can't actually click on because it's obstructed by roofs or like different floors on the map and stuff. And the bot doesn't go through the whole thing. Like as a player, you click on stuff. The bot doesn't do that. It just sends packets. So it could potentially send packets the player never would have sent. We're doing all this stuff on our high level characters. We send bad packets, we get banned. So we decided to just do it manually. Um, so, and then what we did is we wrote a script that when we get an incoming look message, we save that to a file. And then we just ran our regexes again later. So basically it was this process of play the game, see stuff that's highlighted, click on it, it saves all the message we get to a file, and then we run that through our regexes later, right? And we just keep doing that and doing that and doing that and narrowing down the list of items, and we're done. So it took a while. I didn't do this part, luckily. This was done mostly by a guy named Nico. His name was on the first slide. German guy, very smart um, and very dedicated such that there are 23,000 items in the game, and he probably walked around and looked at like 19,000 items, just clicking on them every time the bot said, I don't know what this is to him. And eventually, we had 52,000 lines of XML generated, we had 24,000 items tracked, and we also had about a megabyte of, of uh, binary item data generated, so there's two different file types. There's a binary file that does like attributes like attack and defense and stuff, and there's, then there's an XML which does like description and some other stuff. I don't know why there's two files for it, but. And then let's just combine the results that we got from that. So we ended up generating 130 megabytes of map data. We already saw that. Combining the tile and item counts, almost 30 million items were tracked. So here's some rough back of the envelope math. And I forgot I was using markdown. So there's actually supposed to be a multiply here and a multiply here, but they don't show up because they ended up just italicizing 15. Um, I added this at the last minute right before the talk. So 
the screen, as we saw, is 19 by 15 tiles, and then we could store eight floors in memory at a time. Um, just some rough math. About 90% of screens, when I say screens, we're talking about just that 19 by 15 grid on any floor is empty space. So we're going to multiply by 10 at the end, and we're going to take our 12,000 tiles that we tracked. We're going to divide by the amount of tiles we see per screen, then multiply by 10 because it's only about, they're about 90% empty. We can see about 55,000 screens had to be seen. That's 55,000 unique non-overlapping locations in the game that we had to see to generate all this data. So in our millions of tibia casts that we watched, there was a lot of diversity in there. And there was very few places that we didn't catch on tibia casts. There were a few, but a lot of places we caught. So then we've already discussed this. 57,000 creatures spawned. Our spawns on XML at 125,000 lines. Then 23,000 items, we just saw that. 873 NPCs track with over 9,000 lines of conversations. So the conversations between NPCs and players, which we auto-generated, it was somewhere over 9,000. I couldn't give you an exact number because a lot of that was modified when we went and plugged in quests and we didn't keep the information of where it was at. Um, and then 899 monsters tracked. So really when I say tracked, we got the speed and outfit from the server when we're doing NPC data. The rest of the stuff was automatically generated from tibia.wikia.com, which we did by W getting a bunch of crap and then regexing it. And this is what our private GitHub repo looks like. So we have 131,000 committed. You'll see like deletions, but that's just where we're overwriting the stock information that comes with the OT server with our own. So it comes with some data in what we call the data pack. We replaced it with all our stuff. So you see 430,000 from Raiden. This is the guy who did all of the item looking and stuff. That's why he's got so many lines. 41,000 from this guy. 672,000 from him, 131,000 there, and then 1,000 here. This was the guy who just did the changes to Sharp Map Tracker. So about a hundred or a thousand lines of code changed in Sharp Map Tracker to make it do what we needed to do. Um, this is including the scripts that we used to paste it, to like connect everything together. Those were just like a bunch of wacky Python scripts or whatever we needed at the time. And resources. This presentation, I mean. If you can't get all three of these, just get the presentation link. It's on GitHub, written in Markdown. Don't know why you'd need it, but people do this, so I'm doing it too. Uh, Open Tibia, this is a couple hundred thousand lines of code. If you ever want to know how a game server is made, or if you want to just play with making your own game server, get into game development, it's not a really advanced game, but it's really fun to play with. It's what started me in coding and hacking. So the forgotten server is on GitHub, all the code's there. And then our edition of Sharp Map Tracker is also on GitHub with some of the changes we've made. And questions? No questions? Okay. It went out again.